Hello, everyone. So in the first part of chapter four, you learned about the nature of light, that light is actually a wave. We know that it's a wave because it's got wave-like characteristics or properties. It's got amplitude, frequency, and wavelength. One other thing that light actually has is the fact that it's also a particle. So this is one thing that we didn't really cover in greater detail in the first part of chapter four, that light is also a particle. We mentioned a little bit about it, that light contains photons and photons are massless particles of light. And it was Einstein who who introduced this idea and later on it was called the duality or dual nature of light, that light is both a particle and a wave. So in... For the second part of chapter four, you're going to learn about electrons and that electrons and light actually have a lot of things in common. Uh, You'll learn that electrons um, also have um, wave-like characteristics as well as particle-like characteristics. So in the previous chapter, you learned about different models of the atom, right? Uh, There was J.J. Thompson and the plum pudding model. And then there was Rutherford and his nuclear model. And then in this chapter, you learn about Bohr's model of the atom. But these models of the atom can't really explain a lot of uh, phenomenon. Okay, And so uh, a lot of the chemists and physicists, they had to find a way to explain uh, the behavior of electrons a little bit better. So in chemistry, we learn about quantum mechanics, right? And quantum mechanics is basically the modern type of physics. It's quantum physics, essentially. We learn them, or we learn quantum physics or quantum mechanics because of the fact that it has something to do with electrons. And electrons are important in chemistry because they are the subatomic particles that are involved in chemical reactions and Chemistry is all about chemical reactions. If you understand the behavior of electrons, you'd be able to understand the behavior, the chemical reactions themselves. And so quantum mechanical model is the uh, close to perfection when it comes to uh, a model that explains the behavior of electrons. Okay, So here, quantum mechanical model explains the behavior of electrons, how they exist in atoms, and how they determine physical and chemical properties. So this is introduction to chemistry. So we're only going to look at uh, the basic things uh, regarding quantum mechanics. So I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson that electrons basically behave like light, that they have a lot of things in common, and uh, that uh, that electrons themselves actually have wave-like properties and also particle-like properties. So these electrons have particle-like properties in such a way that um, they have mass, right? Electrons have mass, they have velocity and location. They also have wave-like properties in such a way that they exhibit uh, amplitude, frequency, and wavelength. And you just learned that uh, both frequency and wavelength are related and that they can also... Uh, that you can use these two information to calculate energy. And so electrons exist only at certain energies. And so because of that, electrons themselves contain energy. And the main reason why they have energy is because they they reside within within the atom they call stationary states. Right? or energy levels. But the structure of the atom is actually a lot more complicated and more complex than uh, the Bohr's model of the atom. So it's not as simple as a bunch of electrons uh, revolving around the nucleus. Okay, It's not as simple as electrons residing in stationary states or energy levels. It's a lot more complex than that. And that's what this quantum mechanics is all about, or quantum mechanical model. And we're going to look at orbitals. Uh, We're going to look at energy levels and sublevels and so on and so forth. 
And here's a diagram of Bohr's model of the atom, where you have the nucleus at the center containing protons and, and neutrons, and then you have these orbits or stationary states that are fixed, that, that contain fixed energy, right? Uh, that's why you can also call them energy levels, because they do have a specific energy. And then these electrons reside within these energy levels or stationary states, and that they orbit the nucleus. So this model at the time was already revolutionary because uh, he was able to use this model to explain the spectral lines uh, that they observed in elements, in uh, different atoms, right? But even though Bohr's mo uh, Niels Bohr received the Nobel Prize in Physics in the 1920s, this model actually only works for a hydrogen atom containing a single electron or any other atoms containing only a single electron. Um, but when you use this model uh, to explain um, the same phenomenon in multi-electron uh, atoms, it actually collapses. It, it can't explain uh, the phenomenon. So they, so physicists and chemists at the time, they had to come up with a new model, and that's when uh, quantum mechanics was born. So now let's look at the quantum mechanical model and what it is exactly. So um, we still, it basically still uses the Bohr model, the nuclear model, where you have the nucleus at the center and then a bunch of orbits surrounding the nucleus. But the terminologies here will change um, based on this quantum mechanical model. And so uh, in this model, atoms contain the following okay the first one is energy levels so energy there are energy levels instead of calling them stationary states they are now known as energy levels so it has a symbol lowercase n so you have n equals one for the first energy level n equals two for the second n equals three n equals four and so on and again the higher the n value the greater the energy and so n equals 1 is lower in energy than n equals 2. And n equals 4 is greater in energy than n equals 3, and so on. And the second one here is that atoms contain energy sublevels. So in each energy level, you have at least one sublevel. Okay? And the number of sublevels actually matches the energy level. So if you have energy level 1, that means that you have one sublevel. If you have energy level 2, that means you have two sublevels. Energy level 3, three sublevels, and so on. And these sublevels, they actually have a name. Okay, so you have an S sublevel, a P sublevel, D sublevel, an F sublevel. Besides energy levels and sublevels, atoms also contain orbitals. And orbitals basically reside within the sublevels. Okay, so orbitals by definition are regions of space within an atom where electrons can be found. So this means that electrons cannot exist outside an orbital. Each sublevel contains at least one orbital. So again, we have an S sublevel, P sublevel, D, and F sublevels. All right, so we have four different sublevels here, and each type contains at least one orbital. So let's look at the number of orbitals per sublevel here. So if we have these sublevels, S, P, D, and F, you should remember the number of orbitals for each type of sublevel. So, for example, the number of orbitals in an S sublevel equals 1. Okay? And a P sublevel contains a total of 3 orbitals. A D sublevel contains a total of 5 orbitals. And finally, an F sublevel contains a total of 7 orbitals. And finally, atoms contain electrons. So we mentioned earlier that electrons reside within the orbitals and they can't reside outside the orbitals. 
So each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So regardless of what type of orbital you have, the maximum that each orbital can hold is two electrons. So if you have an s orbital that can hold a maximum of two electrons, if you have a p orbital that also holds a maximum of two electrons, d and f orbitals hold a maximum of two electrons. So make sure that you know the difference between orbitals and sublevels. Now, if we're talking about sublevels, then they have a different maximum number of electrons. Because remember that a sublevel contains a specific number of orbitals. So if you have um, an S sublevel, then that means that you have uh, a maximum number of one orbital okay, inside that sublevel. And so an S sublevel contains one orbital, and one orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So that means that an S sublevel can hold a maximum of two electrons. A P sublevel contains three orbitals. Okay, and so because it has three orbitals, you multiply that by two because each orbital can hold two electrons. Now you have a total of six electrons in the P sublevel. In the D sublevel, you have five orbitals multiplied by two electrons. You have 10. So a D sublevel can hold a maximum of 10 electrons. And then you can do the same thing for an F sublevel. F sublevel has seven orbitals multiplied by two electrons. You get 14 electrons for an F sublevel. So on the test, I could ask you questions that relates to the number of electrons or maximum number of electrons. So I can ask you, what is the ma maximum number of electrons that a P sublevel uh, can hold or uh, an orbital can hold? Uh, another thing that I could ask you on a test is uh, maximum number of electrons per energy level. Right? So how do we calculate the total or maximum number of electrons per energy level? Well, you can use this simple equation. Um, you can use 2n squared where n is the energy level. So, for example, if you have uh, energy level 1, right, you have n equals 1. And so, if you plug the number 1 in this formula, you have 2 times 1 squared equals 2. And so, in n equals 1, the maximum number of electrons that it can hold is 2 electrons. And then if you have n equals 2, that would be 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8. So you have a total of 8 maximum number of electrons on the second energy level, and so on. Okay, and you can break this down if you like um, on how to determine the maximum number of electrons per energy level. But I'm just going to, I'm basically giving you the shortcut here. And you can use this equation to determine the maximum number of electrons per energy level. All right, so let's do a little practice here. How many sublevels orbitals maximum number of electrons are there in the following energy levels? So we have four different energy levels here. We have level one, three, five, and seven. How do we determine the total number of sublevels orbitals and max number of electrons per energy level? So to determine the number of sublevels per energy level, all you have to do is look at the energy level itself, right? So the number of sublevels matches the energy level. So if you have level one, that means you have one sublevel. If you have energy level three, you have three sublevels. Level five, five sublevels. And level seven, seven sublevels. Okay, and uh, we're going to skip the middle one here for now, the number of orbitals, and move on to the maximum number of electrons per energy level. So with, with the maximum number of electrons, we use uh, this equation or formula 2n squared, right? Where n is the energy level. So if you have energy level 1, then the maximum number of electrons would be 2 for level 1. For level 3, that would be 3 times 3 is 9. 
times 2, 18. For level 5, that would be 5 times 5 is 25 times 2, 50. And finally, for level 7, 7 times 7 is uh, 49 times 2, we get 98. 98 electrons for level 7. Now, to determine the maximum number of orbitals per energy level, we can look at uh, the maximum number of electrons. Right? So we know that each orbital contains a maximum of two electrons. So we can actually determine the maximum number of orbitals by simply dividing each uh, max number of electrons by two. Okay, in other words, we're removing this coefficient 2 here. So that means we can use the equation or the formula n squared to determine the maximum number of orbitals per energy level, where n, again, is the energy level number. So again, uh, you can either divide these numbers by 2, or you can plug uh, the energy level number into the equation n squared. Okay, so for number of orbitals for the first one, 2 divided by 2 is 1. 18 divided by 2 is 9. So that means you have 9 orbitals in level 3. And you have 25 orbitals in level 5. And finally, 49 orbitals in level 7. So the other thing that I want to talk about here uh, regarding orbitals is their shape and the shape of the orbitals is actually a mathematical or a statistical um, representation of the orbitals because orbitals by definition are the regions of space with high probability of finding an electron so quantum mechanics is actually also known as statistical mechanics because it uses a lot of statistics, and probability is basically statistics. And so um, that's why orbitals are mathematical or statistical uh, representation of the orbitals. And there are four different types of orbitals that we're going to cover here. There's the s orbital, the p orbitals, the d orbitals, and finally the f orbitals. The s orbital, if you look at it in three-dimensional, uh, it's a sphere. Okay, so uh, for example, this one is the one s orbital, and an s orbital is spherical in shape. And so, when you have um, a one s orbital, that tells you that n equals one. So the first energy level has the one s orbital. If you have a 2s orbital, that means this is the orbital or s orbital in energy level 2. So you have n equals 2 here in this case. You, got, you can also have n equals 3. So as you can see here, the higher the energy level, the larger the volume of that sphere. So that basically tells you that there's a higher probability of finding an electron as the value of n increases. Because the larger the volume, the higher the probability of finding an electron in that sphere. And so the greater the value of n, the higher the energy and the greater the size of that orbital. A 2s orbital, for example, is smaller than a 3s orbital. And so uh, a 3s orbital has a higher probability of, of finding an electron compared to a 2s or a 1s orbital. Now let's look at a cross section of of the orbitals. So as you can see here, when you um, when you cut a small piece of of the orbitals, this is what it would look like inside uh, the orbitals. So again, this is a 2s orbital where you have um, uh, this blank space here or a white space here. So this tells you that you have um, regions, region of space within the orbital in which electrons cannot be found. And they have a name as well. They're called nodes. 
So in the nodes, electrons don't exist. It's basically just empty space. So the second type of orbitals are the p orbitals. And the p orbitals have a dumbbell shape. And that there, there are three different types of p orbitals. There's the px, py, and the pz. So, uh, or you can read this as p sub x, p sub y, p sub z, because the letters x, y, and z are subscripts. And that has, it, that has something to do with uh, the three-dimensional structure or three-dimensional shape. So when you have a p orbital, let's say a px, then the, the lobes, remember that a p orbital looks like a dumbbell. So it contains two lobes. In a p sub x orbital, the lobes are on the x-axis. So they lie on the x-axis. And you can imagine the, the, the rest of the p orbitals. If you have a p y orbital, then the lobes lie on the y-axis. And a pz orbital, you have the lobes that lie on the z-axis. Okay, so uh, make sure you know the, the differences between uh, an s orbital and the different p orbitals. The third type of orbitals are called the d orbitals. And uh, they have a four-leaf clover shape. So what that means is that they have a total of four lobes, uh, which basically kind of looks like a p orbital, except double the number of lobes. Okay, and there are five different types of d orbitals. Again, uh, they, uh, they're mathematical representation of the orbitals. And so they have these uh, weird names. So they're called dxz uh, all the way to dz squared. Okay, and the subscript here, xz, X, xz, yz, and so on, those are the planes. Okay, so if you look at it in terms of three-dimensional, the four lobes basically uh, basically lie on the xz plane for the dxz orbital. Okay, so um, if you imagine, if you're looking at a whiteboard and you have a piece of paper, if you lay it flat on the whiteboard, that's basically your xz plane. Okay? So all four lobes lie on the xz plane, which is the whiteboard. So if we have uh, the yz uh, orbitals, you have the four lobes that are perpendicular to the whiteboard. So now you have that same piece of paper. You're going to flip that and make it perpendicular to the whiteboard. So that's, uh, so the four lobes are drawn on that white piece of paper. And so now you can imagine a DXY where you have an XY plane. Okay, so you have, uh, basically you're flipping that paper and turning it uh, 90 degrees. Okay, so now you have um, the lobes, the four lobes laying flat, but it's still perpendicular to the whiteboard. The fourth one here, the dx squared minus y squared, um, the four lobes or two of the lobes are laying flat on the x-axis and the other two are laying on the y-axis. And finally, a dz squared basically looks like a pacifier, a double pacifier, right? So you have um, the lobes on the z-axis because it's z squared and then a ring in the middle. So again, kind of like a double pacifier. So uh, on the test, I mean, you can have, uh, you can use your notes uh, on the test. And uh, I may ask you, what does a DXY look like? Or what does a, a DZ squared look like? And now the last type of orbitals are called the F orbitals. And you don't need to know what uh, the shape looks like for for the f orbitals. You just need to know that there are seven different f orbitals and that each orbital holds a maximum of two electrons. And so if you have seven orbitals to total, then the f sublevel can hold a maximum of 14 electrons.
So uh, this is basically a summary here. You have the sublevels. You have the S sublevel, P, D, and F sublevels. And it also tells you the maximum number of electrons per sublevel. So an S sublevel has uh, one orbital. A P sublevel has a maximum of three, D5, and F7. And so in terms of number of electrons, or maximum number of electrons, an S sublevel can hold a maximum of two electrons. P would be six. D10 and F sublevel 14 electrons.